Okay, so I'll make a start. My name is Andrew Reader, and I'm from King's College London, and we'll, I'll be covering uh, the basics of PET physics and image reconstruction. I do prefer interaction during lectures if possible, so don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask a question as we go along. So basics of positron emission tomography. It's uh, fundamentally a, a functional imaging technique rather than anatomical imaging technique. That's the basic uh, difference in general. Obviously, you can do functional imaging with MR as well. But uh, PET is all about looking at the function of the body. And that is achieved by using a radioactive uh, chemical compound called a radiotracer that is typically injected uh, intravenously. So uh, the most common choice in PET is uh, fluorodeoxyglucose. We'll come to that molecule in a moment on the next slides. Uh, so we inject the radio tracer. Uh, then if we're not doing a dynamic scan, then that will be injected, you'd wait, and then you'd put the patient inside the PET scanner, or if it's a dynamic scan, you'd put the patient inside the scanner and then inject. You collect PET data, and then finally uh, you reconstruct. And so uh, this lecture will take us um, for the first half hour through the process of how we model uh, PET data acquisition, because that's an important component for reconstructing images. We need to know the forward model. So a closer look then at the case of fluorodeoxyglucose um, labeled with fluorine 18, which is a positron emitter. It's not fluorine 19, it's fluorine 18 and that's unstable. And so F18 uh, converts to oxygen 18 plus emission of a positron. And the positron is the antiparticle of the electron. And when matter and antimatter meet, you get complete annihilation and conversion of mass to energy according to the well known E equals mc squared uh, equation from Einstein. And so that's why we arrive at two photons of 511 keV that are approximately. 100, approximately back-to-back -back photons. So we've injected that radio tracer, it transports through the body, um, hopefully also goes into the brain, fluorodeoxyglucose does, and then we'll be getting positrons being emitted from the FDG, F18 FDG, and we're seeing in this schematic uh, an example single pair of annihilation photons that have, that have come about from the from a positron annihilating with an electron. So we get those two back-to-back -back 511 keV photons, which are very energetic, and the PET scanner uh, normally consists of relatively high-density crystals in order to, to be able to stop and detect those high-energy photons. Um, that's just a case of one event that I'm showing there, but obviously during the course of the PET scan, I'll go into detail as to how we get this measured data in the coming slides, so don't worry for the moment, but just to note that we get uh, many back-to-back -back photon pairs over time being emitted from uh, the subject inside the PET scanner. And again, the goal being that once we've recorded uh, sufficient counts, uh, we would then reconstruct the image representing the radioactive uh, traces uh, distribution, for example, in the brain, which will be the focus um, in this talk. Um, looking at that again from another angle, we could consider we've got an unknown radioactive distribution inside the PET scanner. And here we see a few example back-to-back -back photon pairs being emitted, um, those annihilation photons being detected by the uh, ring of crystals around the patient under study. And the goal of image reconstruction, which we'll be getting to in the second lecture a little bit later, is to estimate um, that radioactive concentration just from those detections. And we could typically have anywhere from 100 million, maybe up to uh, 1 billion such back-to-back -back photon pairs, from which we're trying to reconstruct uh, the 3D distribution of the radio tracer. Um, it's important to understand object representation. Um, really, we're not doing image reconstruction. We're estimating parameters that represent the radio traces distribution. That's strictly what we're doing here. Um, so if you imagine we've got a continuous object, uh, a continuous uh, function, we nearly always discretize in some way, and we nearly always use pixels. Um, and so we're saying that 
the continuous function, the radioactive concentration F as a function of spatial position R is just given by a limited number of pixels. I'll use J equals one to capital J pixels. And those pixels are represented here by uh, a basis function. Um, so that's like a top hat function in 2D, uh, a cube like function, a, a 3D top hat if you like in 3D. And therefore in reconstruction, we're seeking to estimate the coefficient, if you like, the height of each one of these uh, basis functions um, from the measured data. So that's the object representation, the discretization that we're using uh, typically in PET reconstruction. Everything clear so far? Okay. So there it is again, even more explicitly indicated, this time showing that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll assume the, the pixel basis functions um, in our model of the object representation. So what we're seeking are the parameters theta j, so capital J parameters. There I'm showing uh, a coronal slice through a brain, which I've just crudely uh, discretized into a seven by seven array. And then importantly, I'm showing that, of course, we can just rearrange those, those values, those coefficients, those grayscale values for the pixels, rearrange them just into one single column vector theta. And so our task is estimate theta from the measured data. Right, so now the focus of this first half an hour, before you then go on to use SURF to actually do this uh, modeling, the focus is to just look at that acquisition process and how typically we do model it. So this is um, a single point source um, inside a PET scanner. And I've just expressed it as a function F, um, as a function of X and Y. And really F, we, we call it the radio radioactive concentration, but really it's the mean number of positrons being emitted per unit time. It's a mean that we're estimating from noisy measured data. So what happens, of course, with the positron emitting point source is that we get that back-to-back -back photon pairs. Uh, those get detected um, by the PET scanner ring. And then what we can do is characterize that line through the field of view um, by considering initially the XY coordinate system of our original function, and then rotating that to be aligned with that particular line um, of detection, it's called a line of response, where, along, where that event was detected. And so we rotate the XY coordinate system by an azimuthal angle phi, uh, and then we call that rotated system LS, and then we can just simply express that line as a perpendicular distance S from the center of the field of view and an azimuthal angle phi. We're just saying any line in, in a 2D field of view can be characterized by uh, the, the values S and phi. And if we detected one event along that line, then we can plot one count in our so-called sinogram, and it'll become obvious as to why that's called a sinogram in the coming slides. So there's one single count. Obviously, in fact, the sinogram is also discretized. You have a discretization in the radial S direction, and you have a discretization in the viewing angle direction phi. But this will get clearer and clearer as we go along. Um, alternatively, as a, an interesting point, you could just back project into an empty array just to uh, we'll see the utility of that in a moment. Or we can just record the data in list mode format and say, well, I detected an event. Um, on detectors D1 and D2. Um, and then you might even, if you're able, be able to record the energy of uh, photon one, energy of photon two, and the time, and even the time difference, and so on. So this mode data is very flexible. You have many attributes per event. But I'll focus really, I guess, today on the sinogram data format in 2D for simplicity. And then we can just repeat this process. We get another event, back-to-back -back photon <coughs> pairs. That's another S phi coordinate, allows us to plot a second count in the sinogram, back project a second line, get a second event in the list mode data, and so we can carry on. A third event gives three counts in the sinogram, three lines intersecting, three counts in the list mode data. After six back-to-back -back photon pairs being emitted isotropically from that point source, we now have six counts in the sinogram and six intersecting lines in the back projected image and six list mode data, row, late date, list mode data events. 
um, after I think that's 1,000 events, you can now see why a sinogram is called a sinogram. The point source corresponds to a sine wave on a sinogram. And the backstretched image is now this nice 1 over R distribution. And we have 1,000 this mode events. And so what we see is that each point source, and this is another key point, any radio, radio tracer distribution will be assumed to be a collection of point sources of different intensities. Um, now, each point source gives rise to the sinusoidal pattern um, in the uh, sinogram. And we'll be calling that a measured data vector M because, of course, uh, it's discretized. I'm showing it very crudely there, discretized into, I think it's going to be a, a five by five array where I've just chosen five as for viewing angles and five radial positions. And I can, again, like we saw earlier, just stack that into a column vector M to represent the measured data from a PET scan. Um, and also the parameters that we're seeking to estimate, as we saw earlier, um, which were the values, um, the, the parameters theta for pixels also um, it, it corresponds to a vector that we're trying to estimate. So that's the, the object vector theta that we want and it's the measured data vector M that we actually have from the PET scan. So we can build up complexity, a number of point sources. This is a linear system, should be no surprise, because we run that simulation of phosphor emissions, back-to-back -back photon pairs. We now get as many um, sine, sine wave, sinusoidal patterns on the sinogram, as many of those as we have point sources. But of course, the, the, uh, the amplitude um, and phase and so on adjust according to the point source positions. Okay, and so just pointing out, therefore, we have a linear system. So this should all be crystal clear for everybody. It's deliberately meant to be step by step so that everybody stays on board. Any questions? Okay. Building complexity to a slightly more general radio tracer distribution, we can see obviously that the sinogram is again just a, a collection of those um, sinusoidal patterns that we've seen for the point sources. And then going to a more general distribution again, we now very much also see the Poisson noise that we'll be dealing with when we cover the reconstruction part uh, in the next lecture. Um, you can see this is quite noisy sinogram data for a limited number of counts. So let's look at that again now, because I want to focus on the difference between the measured data M and the mean data Q. Uh, that we'll be modeling. So we, we're, we're not going to um, be generating noisy sinograms when we do our forward modeling. We want to generate a model of the mean data that best corresponds with the uh, noisy measurements we obtain. So here's the, again the case of noisy data from point center point source. And it should be no surprise, the center point source gives a, 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 a sort of vertical line in the sinogram. Now, just by using a simple ray tracing model, because what happens over time is that a given line through the field of view um, just corresponds to the line integral of activity. If we have point sources at different positions along that line, then that single line is a single point on the sinogram, and that over time will be approximately equal to the integral of all the point sources along that line. We'll, we'll, we'll see that um, as we go along. But uh, so what we can do is model the mean of the data just by taking line integrals. So I'm just showing that in a very crude animation here, rotating those lines around. Um, and so you better do that in surf effectively, do forward projections uh, along those lines to now generate a noise free model of the mean, which I'm calling Q, which is distinct from the noisy data vector M that was obtained from the PET scanner. Um, so the same holds for a collection of point sources. There's the noisy data vector M. We can model the mean if we know what the true distribution is. That's a big if. Um, if we know what it is, we can easily model the mean data just by doing those line integrals. Is this clear? Okay, going to the famous Shep Logan phantom. As we collect more and more counts, we can see uh, the noise does reduce. With low counts, it's evidently Poisson noise. As we go to high counts, uh, we get a case like that, and then we model the mean just by doing the line intervals. So fundamental difference between mean data and noisy data. What are the mean? So this is where we'll be going later on, but to, for this first 
half an hour of, which we're already well into now, we're just looking at this model of the data Q given uh, a current estimate of parameters theta, because the current estimate of the parameters theta corresponds to a radio tracer distribution. That's exactly what we're trying to find, of course, in reconstruction. So we're just going to be doing the forward model, the system model, which again, the core part of it is in fact line integrals, but in PET, we do need to be a bit more uh, involved than just line integrals, but it's the core of the model that's frequently used. Okay, so um, we've got object parameters theta, which of course could represent any object. Again, for simplicity, I'm just showing a point source there. Um, and then we, what we want to do, sorry, that's a noisy sinogram. It should actually be a nice, clean uh, model of a mean because I'm generating that from a system matrix. I'm just saying here, uh, what needs to be in the matrix A in order for this mapping to hold. So in other words, if we put a point source in and we're expecting one of these sine wave outputs out the other side, what does that say about the matrix A? Just by the very basics of matrix vector multiplication. If we, if we know the output looks like that and the input looks like the, the top right there, what does that tell us about matrix A? What must it look like? Uh, I agree. Perfectly correct statement, but I'm hoping for a bit more intuition. Totally correct, though, yes. Okay. It's huge and sparse. What else? So that's one correct answer. Let's have a few more correct answers. <laughs> we know the size. We know the size, yep. Okay, so how many columns are there? <laughs> be, a bit, be a bit more precise. How many columns? There are many, yes. As many as there are parameters that we're estimating. The parameters that we're estimating are theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, or up to theta j. In other words, the number of pixels in the image that ultimately we want to reconstruct. That's how many columns there are. And how many rows are there? As many as there are sinogram bins. Okay, so it's a huge sparse matrix. We know the dimensions. I still want something a bit more intuitive. Those are all correct answers and correct observations. But look at this case here. What does it tell us about the system matrix A? What does it actually look like? We're doing image reconstruction here. I always find it very helpful to think of images when you're dealing with a matrix. It's all rounded kit. Yeah, again, a perfectly correct answer. <laughs> uh, Not a good one, though. <laughs> but, but yeah, okay, it looks banded. Why? Because we, we're forced to deal with vectors in columns and rows here and those vectors will mean that the overall appearance of that will be this kind of banded large sparse matrix still a, a perfectly correct answer are you talking about undetermined overdetermined is that what you're talking about um I, I, yeah here um typically it's an overdetermined system yeah we can so we've got all these fancy words here large sparse every overdetermined row, every row contains an like one of the almost correct <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, the first wrong answer is actually in the very much in the direction I want to go. But strictly said, so that's not correct. But it's almost correct. So it's going to be the columns must look like these sinogram, these sinusoidal responses, because any given object is a collection of point sources. And the best way to think of matrix vector multiplication is to take the input vector, sit it on top of the matrix, and view it as a collection of weighting factors for each column which are then summed together to give the output. So if the output is just, if the input is just one single value, uh, so it's a zero vector with just one of the elements equal to one, it means it's picking out one column and it's given us that sinusoidal pattern. Therefore, the columns of the system matrix must be sinograms from point sources. But I liked where you were going on the front row here because we'll pick up on the rows in a moment. In fact, maybe we can, yeah, we'll, we'll see that in a second. Okay, so just to drive that point home, to form the system matrix A, effectively we can just step a point source through the field of view, model what the PET scanner does, and that can be done either via the line integral model, where we just do those, those line, those rate, that ray tracing that I was talking about earlier with that rotating set of red lines. We can do an analytic, analytic model like that, often called the radon transform or the 3D X-ray transform. 
parallel ray transform, whatever your favorite name is. You could do a Monte Carlo simulation, of course, though, it needs to be noise free, so you have to run it for a very long time. Or you could literally put a point source inside your PET scanner and measure the response. The catch there is that you don't have the patient in the field of view, so you don't have the unique um, UMAP for the patient. Um, so and you can model detector response, you can measure the detector response. You just keep putting point sources uh, at different locations in the field of view and measure uh, the, the outputs. So here again, I'm showing the discretized case where I've just got a, a crude five by five array. And I'm saying we just got one, but we're just gonna pick out one column of the system matrix and it's got to give um, this sinusoidal output, which I'm also crudely discretizing just for simplicity of filling the, the matrix uh, on this slide. So we take that, we put it into a column vector and put it in a column of the matrix A. And then we can, so that's just rearranging those 25 values into a column vector. And then we can go to the next position in the field of view, measure or simulate or model analytically the, the, the PET scanner response, discretize that, put it in the next column and so on. We just step through every single pixel. Obviously I'm jumping through a lot of them here to save us a lot of time. And it allows me to generate the columns of the system matrix. And what you'll be doing in SURF, I suspect, what most of us do, is um, not storing that information, but calculating it on the fly by doing line intervals. But ultimately, though, this is what we want to do. We just need to um, model, generate columns by modeling the PET scanner response to a single uh, point source at every single location in the field of view. Okay. So the system matrix contains columns, which are the responses to point sources at different positions in the field of view. What about the rows? So on the front row, <laughs> maybe we'll now get the correct answer. What are the rows of the system matrix going to look like based on what you've understood from the modeling so far? We can still say the matrix is large, it's sparse, it's gonna have this banded pattern, it's got uh, J columns, I rows, all of that's still correct. Intuitively, as images, what do the rows look like? The rows are gonna be vectors of what size? Of the size of the image, absolutely. So already we know the rows are gonna have a, an interpretation as a kind of image. What will that image look like? Well, well, okay, right. So when, when we do matrix vector multiplication, we can either do what I said before, take the input vector, use that as a set of weighting factors for the columns, or, or we can just say, if I want one single output value from my output vector, how do I get that? I take the scalar product of a row vector of the matrix with the input vector. Okay, the input vector is an image, is the image that we're modeling the, 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 the mean data for. And the row is going to be also an image. What's the scalar product? It's just a point by point multiplication and a summation. So what does that mean? It means that the row must be a picture, if you like, an image of a line through the field of view. So it's mainly zeros, that's our sparse matrix, but you've got values down a line, and then you take this image of a line, multiply it point by point by the image that you want to model the mean of, and most of it gets set to zero, except for the values along that line, which you sum up, that's what the scalar product does, to give you the alpha value for that sinogram bin. Yeah, so to do the radon transform, uh, if, we if we use a discrete, discrete uh, representation, therefore the rows of a discrete parallel ray transform must be pictures of every single line through the PET scanner field of view. Does that make sense? Yep, I'll repeat it by going, absolutely, I'll, I'll repeat it in the next two slides, so yeah. Um, first of all, to show then what I'm saying, if we look at one row of the system matrix, we can unpack that into a 2D or a 3D image. And if we do, for the case of a PET scanner, um, it will generally look like a line 
uh, a line of response through the PET scanner field of view. We go to the next um, row of the system matrix, and it will look like another line. I'm just picking arbitrary example lines through the field of view here, just for illustration purposes. And I'll clarify again in the next slide to really spell out uh, the columns and rows. Uh, another line, obviously, for the third row and so on. And the point is, we have a lot of flexibility here in principle. You can do time of flight there. You could just um, do a Gaussian modulation along that line according to the time of flight information that you might have for the, for the sinogram, where you would set to zero values to the left and to the right along that line, and then increase the probability of emission from where you estimate it to have come from based on the time of flight information. So, and you could also put positron range in here. You could just, for example, uh, convolve that line with, with a, a simple kernel, which would then say, well, actually, um, it's also collecting values that are slightly off of that line as well due to the implicit blurring of positron range. But these are all pictures. They're, they're probability density function pictures, if you like. That's a, a way of intuitively understanding what the system matrix looks like. But a lot of the time, we just do simple line integrals, and then we factorize the matrix, as, we'll, as I'll show you in a few moments. But here's the summary, or it be on the next slide, just to say here, the system matrix contains rows, which indicate which pixels or voxels contribute to each measurement um, in, the, in the measured data. Okay, so here's the summary, which I hope is going to repeat what I've just said. If it doesn't, please ask me to repeat it yet again. I'm saying that um, the columns correspond to the, the um, PET scanner response to every possible point source position in the scanner field of view. I think the columns are clear for everybody. And then we're saying that the output um, sinogram values must correspond to taking the scalar product of each of the rows with the input object vector. So that means if we're doing um, a line integral, it would mean take one of those rows, okay, turn it into uh, a 2D image just by unpacking the values, turn it into, for example, a five by five grid like I was showing earlier. And then you multiply that five by five grid element by element by your input object that you want to forward model. And once you've done that point by point multiplication, it's effectively done a mass of your image. So as you've set to zero all the values outside of that line and just kept the values on that line, and then you just sum them up, which is what the scale of product does. And of course that corresponds to a line integral. Yeah, okay. So, you know, everything can be done this way. Fourier transforms can be looked at this way as row and columns. So convolutions can be looked at this way. You know, any kind of simple uh, matrix vector operation can always be visualized in terms of rows and columns. It's very informative to, to do that. Right, so for PET now, let's look at what the system matrix can contain. Um, it's important to note that more or less with the exception of randoms, it can model the entire acquisition process with all of its subtleties. And it's convenient in practice to factorize it because most of the time we cannot store the system matrix in memory. So we're going to, what we're going to do is use a whole um, product of different matrices to build in complexity. Because the one I've been talking about up to now is the core matrix, which is line integrals. And you can get away with a, a fairly basic PET reconstruction just by understanding the line intervals. If you want to do more advanced reconstruction, begin to compensate for limited resolution, positron range, build in attenuation, normalization, time of flight, object motion, then you can again put that all into the matrix as well, as I'll show here by this factorization approach. So if you had a an object, uh, an image that you're wanting to forward model to predict what the PET scanner would do to that. First of all, for example, you could say, well, actually, uh, the head moved by a certain amount, and so we could model the motion by an initial matrix M. Then we could blur the object according to the known positron range. Then we can do the model I've been emphasizing, which is the core model, which is do the ray tracing, the line intervals, 
then we could, with that, we could modulate those lines, draws with time of flight information if we wanted to do that. Then we can attenuate the values by known attenuation values from some new map. And we can then also build in um, the normalization problems that the scanner might have. So if, it, if it's less sensitive between certain crystal pairs, then instead of correcting that effect, remember we're doing a forward model, we don't do corrections, we are modeling the problems. So we don't do attenuation correction, we attenuate the data, we don't do normalization correction, we introduce the normalization problem in our forward model, and that's what we're doing here. Um, and then you could build in limited detection resolution and so on. And so we end up with a factored system matrix that might look something like that. And I think what we're about to do in the SURF exercise is focus on the case of the matrix X with no time of flight information as the basic forward model. But notice how easy it would be to build in resolution modeling just by doing a convolution before you forward model. Yes, question. Do you include the detector response into the X matrix? Or... Uh, you can. You, you, um, you, you could, in theory, yes, because this could always be summarized as a matrix A. You could generate that by a long, slow Monte Carlo simulation with all of your detector peculiarities built in. If you run it for long enough, eliminate noise, then yes, you could build in the detector response. Yeah. So in general, the system matrix is a mapping from the parameters which represent the image or the object, if you like, um, that map that to the mean data Q, uh, model of the mean of the Poisson distributed data. We'll be getting on to that in the next lecture after we've done this practical exercise where we go through the Poisson log likelihood and the reconstruction method that we use. Um, system matrix is the mapping um, that, that takes us from theta to the model of the mean. So that's now over to Chris to start the practical. Thank you.